Hello. Hello. Well, good, e good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the Minnesota Zoo and our, our Our World Speaker Series. Uh, we're happy to have you join us tonight. Uh, my name is Josh Lay. I'm the Communication and Media Relations Manager right here at the Minnesota Zoo. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment, which provides funding to make this event free for all who attend. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and to allow wider access for the presentation, we offer live captioning with an emphasis on live. Um, our captioner is typing as I speak and has no idea what's going to be said next, which is probably true. Uh, so we ask in advance for your understanding when the words may be incorrect. Um, but now I would like to introduce Bill Severud and Liz Dengate. Um, Bill actually grew up right here in Plymouth and attended Carleton College, Northwest, North, Northern Michigan University, and the University of Minnesota. He is currently a postdoctoral associate at the University of Minnesota researching deer winter habitat use and moose calving phenology. You have a lot of big words in your bio. <laughs> Bill has also been involved in research on moose calf survival, cause specific mortality, and their subsequent effects on population performance with the Minnesota DNR. Uh, beaver foraging ecology in Michigan's Upper Peninsula and Voyagers National Park as well as prairie dogs and ferrets in Montana. I love ferrets. <laughs> um, if that wasn't enough to keep him busy, he even, talked, he even taught English in Japan for two years. So way to show us all up. <laughs> um, Liz has worked at the Minnesota Zoo since 2014, uh, coordinating the teaching and community education programs. But before coming to the zoo, she worked at, at the Northern Park Service, or sorry, National Park Service at Isle Royale in Colorado, and for the U.S. Forest Service in Northern California, and co-founded the Sustainable Food Program and Campus Farm at the University of Minis Minis Michigan uh, while completing her Conservation Ecology Master's Degree. You also have really big words in your bio, Liz. <laughs> um, she... <laughs> She is originally from Detroit, Michigan. So, without further ado, please welcome Bill and Liz. Thanks, Josh. All right. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? I'm not used to this fancy microphone. Perfect. Um, so I'm very excited to be here tonight as part of this speaker series talking about moose on Isle Royale. I'm going to be talking um, about the Isle Royale portion of our program tonight, and then I'll turn it over to Bill to bring it home here in northern Minnesota. Um, so I'm going to talk about where and what exactly Isle Royale is and what my connection to it is, talk about the history of moose and wolves there, um, and how we get the data as part of the, um, the Isle Royale Wolf Moose Study as the longest continuous running wildlife study anywhere in the world, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then talk a little bit about what is next for moose on Isle Royale. So where is Isle Royale? Um, it's way up here in Lake Superior, um, so it's actually closest to Canada. It's about 14 miles between Canada and the island at the narrowest point. Uh, but for some reason it belongs to the United States. We got really lucky. Um, and there was a treaty way back when Benjamin Franklin fought really hard for us to get the island. And so it's one of our national parks. And then, to make it even more confusing, it's actually one of Michigan's national parks, yeah. even though the next closest land body is Minnesota. Uh, but it belongs to Michigan. We actually traded a piece of Ohio for it. <laughs> Pretty good deal. Uh, so I'm a native Michigander, so I'm going to use we as a Michigan. I realize that's a little confusing. But. Minnesota is pretty great too, and we have the, we're the closest state, um, so it's about maybe 16 or 17 miles from Minnesota to Isle Royale, um, and 50 to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So it's very isolated, long, skinny, narrow island. I guess I can look here, I don't need to look up there. Um, it's what's known as an archipelago, so it's one 
big island surrounded by a collection of smaller islands that all make up the national park. Uh, it is home to, there we go, um, it's home to uh, kind of a uh, claim to fame is this little island right there it is known as Ryan Island, which is on Siskiyou Lake on the southern side of Isle Royale. And Ryan Island is the largest island on the largest lake on the largest island on the largest lake in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty awesome. And that's it right there. <laughs> uh, so there's different ways you can get to Isle Royale. You can take a seaplane from Michigan or Minnesota. They just opened a route from Minnesota. Um, or you can take any of these ferry boats from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan or from Grand Portage, Minnesota. It takes um, anywhere from 20 minutes if you're taking the plane to six hours if you take the Ranger 3. Um, so I worked there uh, with the National Park Service for three seasons as an interpretive park ranger. Um, giving programs on the Wolf Moose research, but because it was a small park, we all got involved in a little bit of everything and catching lines for the ferry boats and search and rescues and things like that. Um, and then I um, have been there many times just on recreational backpacking trips and also had the fortune to travel there last, this past summer, with a grant from the Minnesota Zoo. Uh, the Minnesota Zoo has a grant program for its employees to volunteer and contribute their time to wildlife projects around the world. So I went and participated in the research project uh, for eight days this past summer. Um, and a kind of cool connection, the grant program is in honor of Ulysses S. Seal, who actually was the first person to point out the genetic situation with the wolves on the island and also found this impressive set of antlers, which are now in the cabin that houses the headquarters of the Wolf Moose Research Project there. Um, and he has a connection to Bill as well, actually. So, small world. Everybody that works on wolves and moose that kind of gets interconnected, I guess. So, Isle Royale, as I said, is home to the longest continuous re continuously running wildlife study anywhere in the world. And it's perfect for studying interactions between these animals since it is this isolated laboratory. It's kind of a natural um, laboratory to study uh, these species. And it's further simplified by the fact that not that many animals are there compared to the mainland since you have to cross at least 14 miles of open water to get there. So this is the list of every mammal species found on Isle Royale. There's only 19 compared to about 40 or more in northern Minnesota or Canada. So most of them are, you might notice at the top there, most of them are bats. And that's the biggest group. So these ones at the top are all different species of bat. Um, and then the two that we're going to talk about tonight um, are, of course, moose, and then we can't talk about moose without talking about the gray wolf as well. So, moose have been on the island um, a pretty long time, at least compared to wolves, geologically speaking. They've hardly been there at all, but um, they've been there since the early 1900s. Uh, any guesses how they would have gotten there? Ooh, swimming, yes. So swimming, actually. Um, ice, ice bridge is a great guess, and that's going to come up in a, a second. But um, the yeah, moose are pretty skittish on ice. They're also you know can weigh over a thousand pounds. So yeah, ice has to be it's got to be a solid piece of ice to support a moose. So they actually swam. They're really good swimmers. Their hairs are all um, uh, yeah. It's a, moose with a couple ducks hanging out. Um, so the, the hairs of moose are all hollow, which makes them not only very well insulated in the winter, but also incredibly buoyant. So they can swim really well. When I was working there as a park ranger, I talked to someone that came into the visitor center who had been out fishing a mile offshore, and he saw a moose come from Canada and swim by his fishing boat and swim up onto the rocky shore. And he said the moose just stood there for like 30 minutes before um, shaking himself off a little bit and walking off into the woods. 
it's good to go. So even with those long, spindly legs, that's how they can get out to the island. Um, and they love the little offshore islands. The moose need to protect their calves from the wolves. And often they'll do that by swimming out to some of the offshore islands since they're really good swimmers. Even the calves can swim pretty well. And wolves do not appreciate swimming very much. So they won't make it out there. So wolves, they don't like swimming. You guys earlier mentioned ice bridges. And that is exactly how the wolves came to the island. And the current population of wolves has only been there since the 1940s. Um, so it's a pretty recent history on the island. Um, so this is a satellite image of Lake Superior in the winter. Uh, you can see why the island is sometimes called the Eye of the Wolf. Uh, so the island, this little laser pointer here. So here's the Isle Royale. Uh, and uh, it used to be about three out of every four years, uh, an ice bridge would freeze solid between the mainland and the island. And that's how wolves crossed over. So it's a classic predator-prey relationship. Uh, the wolves on the island pretty much only eat moose. Occasionally they'll get a beaver or a snowshoe hare, but moose is by far the bulk of their diet. And the moose's only predator on the island is the wolf. So there are no black bear, there's no coyote. Um, those things don't really eat moose much anyway. But um, yeah, wolves are the only predator of moose there, and there's, of course, no hunting since it's all a national park. So, in 1959, the, um, they, the research study published their first year of data, and we've got this continuous population count running since then. Um, and I'll, I'll bring us the 2017 numbers um, in a few minutes. But you can see here on this graph, the moose are the black squares, and they're measured on the uh, far right here. So they go up to a maximum of 2,500 moose on the island at one time. And the island, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but it's about 47 miles long and 10 miles wide. So that's a very high density of moose. Um, and the wolves are the little uh, white diamonds there. They're measured over on the left and they go up to a maximum of 50 wolves on the island at one time. So you can see between the 50s and the 80s, we kind of had this classic up and down oscillating pattern. And the wolves would go up and then the moose uh, would uh, you know, echo that maybe 10 or 15 years down the road. And then in the mid 80s, there's that huge crash of the wolf population. Um, you, there's, um, you can maybe guess some different things that would cause the wolf population to suddenly decline. Um, but in this case, the cause was a canine parvovirus. So there was a visitor to the island who came in his private boat and brought his pet dog with him. Uh, it was illegal to bring dogs. It's illegal to bring dogs into a lot of national parks. Um, for precisely the reason that they can introduce disease. So he didn't know it, but his dog had parvovirus, and it spread to the wolf population on the island. And in two winters, they dropped from 50 to 12. So the 12 that remained had some kind of immunity to parvovirus, but also uh, were pretty closely related at that point. So since then, there's uh, been the constant issue of genetic depression and some inbreeding issues with the wolves on the island. Uh, so, what happened after the wolves crashed? Look at the moose line there. So the, the moose were totally released from the pressures of predators and climbed way up to that maximum of 2,500, uh, which is really way too high for an island of that size. Uh, but in the mid-90s, you couldn't find a lot of tree species on the island anymore. They totally disappeared. And the winter of 1996 uh, was apparently a very nasty winter. Um, does anyone remember the winter of 96? Yeah. So, really cold on Isle Royale as well, and they just hadn't been able to bulk up enough and eat enough vegetation 
during the summer, which is crucial for building up the body fat stores that they need to survive through the winter. So more than half of them uh, died of starvation in one winter. Uh, there are over a thousand moose um, that died in the winter of 96. They're still finding moose skeletons from that winter, that um, uh, 96ers, they call them. So we know that that is way above the carrying capacity for an island of that size. And after the moose dropped, they've been going up and down at a more reasonable number, and they're currently on a strong upward trend because the wolves are very, very low right now. So the wolves, um, they, they recovered a little bit after the parvovirus introduction, but they were in such low numbers that um, just random chance can have a really big effect at that point. So, for example, in 2011, uh, there's old copper mining pits on the island, and three wolves slipped and fell into one, and the sides were all frozen, and they could not get out. So when there's only 12 left, three healthy adults dying is a, a big blow to the population. And currently there are two wolves on Isle Royale. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk more about what they're going to do about that later on. This is always the really kind of bummer part. There's a lot of <laughs> moose dying and wolves dying, but the moose are doing spectacularly well on Isle Royale right now. Uh, there's a lot of them. And if you want to see a moose in the wild, Isle Royale is the place to do it. Uh, if you spend more than a day there, I can almost guarantee that you'll see a moose there. Um, so, where do we get all those numbers from, all of those population numbers? A lot of it is collected in the winter, so they fly out in seaplanes. The park is actually closed to the public between October 31st and the beginning of April. Kind of varies depending on the snow and ice that year. So the only exception to that is that the research team goes out in February for winter study. There's actually a zany murder mystery novel called Winter Study by Nevada Bar, if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, about Isle Royale. So um, people go out there. They um, the researchers, maybe six to ten of them, live in a little cabin, wood stove, and make flights over the island every day, weather permitting, in this little plane. They've um, had a succession of pilots all named Don, coincidentally. <laughs> and uh, winter is great because, um, why is winter great? No leaves. Yes, yeah, exactly. No leaves. Uh, a lot of the island is evergreens, like spruces, so that doesn't matter so much, but about half of the island is deciduous trees, and the tree cover is much emptier, and then you can also follow tracks in the snow. So they can um, find the animals much faster that way. Um, so they've been going out there for 50 plus years. Uh, that's Ralph Peterson and John Musetich and one of the Dons over there on the, on the right. And Ralph and John are the two lead researchers of the project. So then in the summer, so in the winter they're, they're literally counting from the plane. Um, and they count every single wolf and follow the wolves, but they just do... Um, surveys of the moose, uh, they'll divide the island into quadrants and count all of the moose within a few quadrants and extrapolate for the entire area of the island. Uh, but in the summer, they're actually getting out on foot. They have these teams of volunteers, which is the program that I volunteered for over the summer. And they send the volunteers out off trail into the island to find the moose kills that they noted from the air during the winter. And people head out and um, look for those GPS points, as well as looking for any other bones, sheds, scat, tracks, any kind of clues that they can pick up. So um, when I participated this summer, I, we went out in a team of six. Uh, this was the first moose uh, kill site that we found. So you can see the the spine and the skull of the moose in the front there, it's laying on a bed of hair. 
Uh, and this was a site that we knew about, that we were searching for. We had the GPS waypoints for it. Um, and so this was a, a wolf kill. Those are becoming fewer now, now that there's only two wolves on the island. So a lot of the moose that you find now have actually died of arthritis or uh, starvation in some situations or other old age things that happen to moose. Um, so we took a, a route <laughs> off trail, um, uh, bushwhacking through the forest, um, and as we walked, often you know we were fording beaver dams or pushing our way through bogs or swamps. It's pretty fun. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, nobody fell into this beaver pool, uh, so we were always looking for bones and sheds during the day, and then at night we would set up camp wherever we ended up that night. Um, and this was in early June, so it was still a little chilly, but it was pretty nice. They primarily go out in May and up until the very beginning of June, just because the undergrowth isn't quite so dense then. It's easier to see things on the ground. Because uh, we were looking for bones like this. So we found six moose skeletons in the course of eight days and two of them were ones that we knew about ahead of time and four of them we just stumbled across. So we would walk shoulder to shoulder in a line through the forest and if somebody saw something on the ground they would yell bone or shed and everyone would gather around and we'd make bigger and bigger circles and see if we could try to find a whole skeleton there. And sometimes they'd be half buried in duck or moss and uh, you'd think that a root was a bone. Uh, so many times that happened, you get really excited and then it's just a root. Uh, but we did find six of these, six moose skeletons. So once you find the bone, you find all the other bones, we would try to get as close to a complete skeleton as possible. The bones might often be scattered really far throughout the forest because different predators and scavengers, you know, were chewing on the bones and took them off in different directions. And so there was always inevitably a few bones that we would never find. Um, but we'd lay them all out, photograph everything, and check all of the bones for anything strange and any signs of arthritis. Moose can get um, really bad arthritis, just like people can. They also get osteoporosis and gingivitis and periodontal issues. Um, so a lot of the same issues that happen to people happen to moose as well. Um, so sheds, if we found a shed antler, and of course uh, male moose grow out a new set of antlers every year and shed them at the end of every fall, regrow them again the next spring. So we found lots and lots of shed antlers out there. And we would um, measure them and then saw an X into the end so that if anyone else came across in the future, we'd know, they'd know we already recorded that one. But for the, um, the bones, we would uh, keep, take lots of data, measure everything, record what we had found, what we didn't find, and then we would collect some of the bones. So the moose actually always walk on like their tippy toes as they walk around. And the metatarsal bone and the metacarpal bone, if you look at a moose, you would say, oh, those are their lower legs, but they're actually their foot bones. Um, so they, their, their foot goes down and then their toe is like that little bit with the hoof right at the very end of it. So it's like they're walking on crazy tiptoes. So we would collect the metatarsus, which is that, um, like their foot bone. And the cool thing about the metatarsus is that it does almost all of its growing before the calf turns one. So uh, about half of it is when it's still in the womb, and then after it's born, within the first year, it grows, and then it never grows again after that. So moose calves have crazy gangly legs, right? And then um, the, the other leg bones continue to grow, but not that one. So you can tell a lot about how healthy that moose was and how much nutrition they were getting in that first year of life by taking that bone and measuring it. And I'm going to come back to this in a second, but they have found that there's a very strong correlation between nutrition as an infant 
and the likelihood that you'll get arthritis later in life. So we collected the metatarsus, we collected the skull, and we collected the jaw with the incisors. You could age the moose by looking at those incisor teeth. And taking the skull was us showing that that moose had been counted. So if we found a bunch of bones but no skull, that would mean that another researcher had already recorded that moose in the data, and so we would leave the bones there. Which is always a little disappointing to like find bones and then not get to do anything with them. Uh, and we would also collect any bones that looked weird. So these um, are what's known as Windigo antlers. Um, it's kind of hard to see with the background, but there are these antlers that grow this crazy wild growth pattern. They found two instances of it on Isle Royale. We did not find any, but um, we did find some uh, weird ribs that had clearly been broken and regrown, so we would take things like that back too. Um, so this study, we, we're now into almost 60 years of the wolf moose study, and a lot of different information has come out of this study. Um, first of all, the most recent numbers, moose are up to 1,600, and they are, they've been growing at a rate, their population has been growing by over 20% a year for the last six years, and wolves are at two, maybe only one. They are not sure if the older male wolf is still alive on the island. Um, and the two wolves that are there are a father and daughter um, who will never mate with each other. So it's, you know, these are the final wolves on the island. Um, and the, the male is pretty old, the, the female is still young and healthy as far as we know. Um, so we've been learning a lot about human health actually from studying the moose on Isle Royale. There have been a number of studies published about um, the lessons that moose arthritis can help us learn about human arthritis. And they've been finding that those same correlations where the nutrition and health of an infant translates into the likelihood of getting osteoarthritis later in life. Um, and moose can, just to go back here, there's a healthy moose hip joint A and then you can see increasing levels of arthritis in that moose hip joint. And there's a healthy joint as well there. Um, so moose typically, once they get that really bad arthritis, normally would be killed by wolves. They'd be easy prey for wolves because they're moving slower, uh, which is uh, really a good thing because it's extremely painful for moose to live many years with arthritis that bad. Um, they don't have, obviously, anything that they can do about it. Um, so now that the island has so few wolves, we're seeing a lot of moose living a lot longer with some pretty extreme health issues. Um, and living much longer than they would normally if there was a normal level of predators there. Um, climate change, of course, is playing a role on the island as well. So. Um, that I said the ice bridge between Canada and the island used to form about every three out of every four years. It's currently in one out of 10 years that the lake is freezing over. So the likelihood of more wolves coming over on their own is very slim. Uh, one, uh, there was an ice bridge a few years ago that formed and everyone was like really excited. Maybe some wolves are gonna come over. And instead, one wolf left. <laughs> uh, so that was a bummer. Um, yeah, so we'll see. Probably no wolves are coming on their own. Um, and climate change is um, not ideal for moose because moose like it very cold. Um, I heard about a study from many decades ago where a researcher uh, put a moose in an artificially cooled room and kept lowering the temperature and spraying the moose with ice water and was measuring metabolism and stress levels and trying to see when the moose could not compensate anymore and was <coughs> unable to get to a point where the moose appeared uncomfortable in any way. Uh, so moose do not mind the cold at all, uh, but they really don't like it when it's hot. So uh, they, they don't sweat, right? They can't cool themselves <laughs> off really. They have that thick fur coat even in the summer. So if it gets really hot, their only choice is to stand in a pond somewhere for the heat of the day 
And that means that they can't eat as much as they normally would. They need to eat 40 pounds of vegetation in order to bulk up enough for the winter. So if it gets too hot, they're not able to, to eat enough. And idle royal is, so far it hasn't gotten um, in too inhospitable, inhospitable for moose, but it is um, kind of at the southernmost edge of moose's range right now. Although that is, has been changing, it sounds like they're moving south in some places. Climate change also means more ticks. So Isle Royale is it's an amazing place to visit. There's no poison ivy there. Um, there are no ticks that bite humans there. There are only these things called winter ticks, um, which if they jump onto a human, immediately jump off. And do not like people. But they love moose. So ticks can be a big problem for moose. They can actually die of blood loss in some cases. Um, and they'll lose sometimes too much hair to survive the winter because the ticks are itchy and they're trying to get them off. Um, so ticks can be a big problem for them and with the longer season, longer summer season, there are more ticks there as well. Um, so we're going to talk about Minnesota in just a minute, um, but you guys might have heard that moose um, have been declining in Minnesota in recent years. and. Um, they also, uh, deer in Minnesota, are carriers of brainworm. And if brainworm gets into a deer, um, it does not kill the deer. It acts as a normal parasite would, where it uses the host. But if it kills the host, the host isn't really useful to it anymore. So it lives out its life cycle in the deer, and eventually is pooped out, and then the little larvae get picked up by these little snails, and the life cycle continues when another infected slug or snail gets eaten by another deer. But if that little brain worm gets instead eaten by a moose, the little infected slug or snail, then it acts differently in the moose than it does in the deer. It causes the moose to walk around in circles and uh, die. So it actually kills the moose. Um, this hasn't been really an issue for a long time because moose lived a lot farther north than deer did, but their uh, ranges are starting to overlap. And that's, um, that's something that makes Isle Royal really important for moose because white-tailed deer are not on Isle Royal. Um, they have not been there. They can't swim that far. They can't, they, um, they can't get that far in the winter, and in the winter there's no smell of fresh vegetation to bring them over the ice. So it's a, a refuge from white-tailed deer and all of the diseases that they carry for moose. Um, so the moose on Isle Royale don't have to worry about brainworm. So there's a lot of big decisions coming up next for Isle Royale. This is Tobin Harbor on Isle Royale. Um, Carl Tahar is another ranger there. Um, so the, the big question, right, is should we reintroduce wolves to the island? Uh, ecosystems are much healthier when you have a top predator that can keep those moose at a healthy level. It's not good for the moose if they go into like boom and bust cycles, and it's not good for all of the plants on the island that get overeaten when the, the moose numbers are too high. Uh, but there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, there's the value of the ongoing research, which depends on that predator-prey relationship, and there's the fact that the island is a refuge from deer. Um, but there's also the threat of future climate change, meaning that down the road, maybe the island will be too warm for moose to survive, and then what's going to happen to the wolves if moose start declining on the island? Um, and then there's the big what the National Park Service is wrestling with right now is that the entire island is designated Wilderness Act. Designated Wilderness under the Wilderness Act, uh, which means that humans are not supposed to interfere. Um, and, you know, human interference, sometimes well-intended, can go terribly wrong. So um, it's always good to be thoughtful about making those decisions about whether we should introduce more individuals to the island or not. So they, the National Park Service uh, had a public comment period uh, earlier in 2017 and are supposed to announce a decision about whether or not they're going to reintroduce wolves to the island uh, by the end of this year. Um, if they do decide to reintroduce wolves, they will probably bring them from northern Minnesota, 
Uh, it's very similar habitat. And those wolves are already accustomed to eating moose. Um, if they decide not to bring them over, those two wolves are probably going to they'll be around a few more years. Um, but the moose numbers are just going to keep going up and up and up, and we'll probably see a repeat of what happened in the mid-90s, uh, where we get really high numbers of moose. So it's an interesting question, and if you are um, intrigued by this, just sometime in the next month or two, there should be some news on the wolf situation. So lots of big thanks to the Minnesota Zoo for supporting me and going there to do some research this summer. Um, and to my department here at the zoo, as well as Ralph and Candy Peterson, who are in the picture there, who hosted us at the first and last nights of the trip, and my whole team. We had a Canadian, so we called ourselves the A team. <laughs> uh, and they were awesome research mates for a week out there. Uh, these are also some other good resources if you are interested in learning more about uh, moose and wolves on Isle Royale. That's the website of the research project. They publish an annual report every year, which you can download for free as a PDF and get all the um, up-to-date data. There's some good books and videos. Um, and that's my um, email address there if you want to talk further about any of this stuff. I always love talking about moose. Um, and yeah, Bill and I are going to stick around at the end for some, some questions, too. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to turn it over because we're going to bring it to northern Minnesota now where the moose picture looks a little bit different. There you go. All right, thanks, Liz. Uh, my name is Bill Sieverud. I'm a postdoctoral associate at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I just finished my doctoral research on, on moose in northern Minnesota. So, as a moose researcher, it's always really exciting to hear about Isle Royal because that's like the moose project, the big moose study. So it's um, always very exciting to hear about. So today I'm going to be talking about the status of moose in Minnesota. Um, I'll be going through the, the population levels of um, how the population is doing and the current research that's being done by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. So historically, Minnesota's moose population is kind of shifted with kind of with the times. Before European settlement, moose mostly inhabited this kind of north central part of the state. Um, the Arrowhead region was was where they were mostly caribou found. By about 1965, due to land use changes, logging and other things, uh, caribou were largely lost from the state and moose had kind of moved into that the Arrowhead region. <clears throat> By 1986, we had two distinct populations of moose in the state. One in the northwest, kind of in the Aspen Parkland region, and one um, in the Arrowhead region, where we have more of a typical like, boreal forest. And then by 2010, that northwestern population had pretty much disappeared from the landscape, and the majority of, of the state's moose were in the Arrowhead. So this is a population a graph of the northwestern population in that Aspen Parkland region. And you can see throughout the 80s there were about 4,000 moose on the landscape. And throughout the 80s and into the early 2000s, the population just crashed rather precipitously. And so it was so low that it's the last time they were counted in 2007, there were fewer than 100 moose found in the survey. So what happened to the population? Why did it crash? The population was experiencing very low pregnancy rates, but high calf survival, but also very low adult survival. And this was found to be the result of poor nutrition and parasites that were um, often given to the moose from, from deer, like Liz had um, uh, explained earlier. And these were all kind of exacerbated by climate change. So now, in the northeastern part of the state, we have also started to see signs of a decline in the population. In about 2005-2006, the, uh, the northeastern population had about 8,000 moose. And that's declined to about, it's declined about 55% to where, as now we have just under about 4,000 moose up in northeastern Minnesota now. So there's been some evidence of kind of a stabilization over the last four or five years, 
but it's definitely a lot lower than it was back in the early 2000s. So in response to this rather dramatic decline in moose, the Department of Natural Resources initiated two intense studies of, of moose, one studying adult survival and one studying calf survival. And I'm going to be getting into those in a second. So first of all, how do we count moose here in Minnesota? And Liz mentioned how they count moose in Isle Royale, but um, in Minnesota here we do a very similar thing where we, we um, you can see this is moose range and it's mostly the Superior National Forest with uh, the darkened area at the top is the Boundary Waters. This uh, moose range is divided into different plots and every year um, about 40 to 50 plots are randomly chosen and the Minnesota DNR takes helicopters out and flies the plot fairly intensely to look for moose. And this is winter time, so like Liz mentioned, there's you know, no leaves on the trees, but there, there is a lot of coniferous forest up there. So you can see in here there's a group of three moose that the helicopter has spotted. But in addition to counting the number of moose they see, they try to estimate how much hiding cover is around the moose. So they can try to estimate how many moose they're not seeing on the landscape. So then the population number is kind of corrected for those moose that they're not able to detect. When they see moose, they fly back and circle the moose and try to determine if it's male or female, and if it's an adult, a calf, or a yearling. So just to draw some comparisons to what we just heard to um, northeastern Minnesota, you can see that um, you know, Isle Royale is here, and this is moose range in northeastern Minnesota. So it's um, about, northeastern Minnesota moose range is about six times as big as, as um, Isle Royale. There's also some very important predator differences. Uh, in, on Isle Royale we just have wolves, and maybe not for much longer. And in northeastern Minnesota, we have wolves, black bears, and, and also bobcats, lynx, the occasional mountain lion that might, might be able to prey on moose calves. Another very important distinction is that there are deer in northeastern Minnesota, and more importantly, all the parasites that they bring with them. And I'll get, get into them a little bit more in a bit. Um, in addition, in northeastern Minnesota, there's timber harvest that happens, so cutting down trees can can be a way to stimulate uh, habitat, a good habitat for moose, but um, that you know, doesn't well because it's a, a wilderness. And then the density of moose is much different too. As Liz mentioned, the densities can get very, very high in Isle Royale, and on the mainland here, they're much, much less dense. Okay, so the Adult Mortality Project was, um, had a goal to try to understand when moose were dying and why. The goal was to maintain 100 GPS collared moose on the landscape for three years. And the collars they had um, were very sophisticated. They had a GPS unit in them that would um, take a location of the moose every four hours, and it also had a sensor in it that if the collar stopped moving, would send our phones a text message saying, this moose is likely dead, and we should go investigate. The goal was to try to respond to death within 24 hours, so we could get a more accurate uh, assessment of, of why the moose died. The ultimate goal was to extract the entire carcass out of the field, and bring it down to the veterinary diagnostic lab on the University of Minnesota's campus. And as Liz mentioned, moose can weigh uh, up to a thousand pounds or more, so getting them out of the field intact can be quite a, a challenge. Um, and in the cases when we could not extract the moose carcass, we performed a field necropsy. So a necropsy is like an autopsy, but on an animal. So in addition to the GPS collars that the adults were wearing, a subset were also implanted with this little thing here, which is called a, a mortality implant transmitter, or an MIT. It was about the size of like uh, two C batteries. And at capture, these mortality implant transmitters were placed in the back of the moose's throat and they would swallow it. So moose are ruminants, like cows, they have four chambered stomachs, and this mortality implant transmitter would sit in one of those chambers and would not, be, would not pass through the animal. 
So the point of this transmitter was to record body temperature and also the presence or absence of a heartbeat. And if the body temperature went below a certain threshold, or if it no longer detected a heartbeat, the sensor would send a signal to the caller, and then that, uh, the caller would then send us a text message and say, something's probably wrong with this moose. So it, it was kind of like an early detection system. So we had the mortality sensor in the caller, so if the caller was still for, say, eight hours, we would get the text message. But these mortality implant transmitters were a way to kind of get a, a, a jump start. So when we got a mortality message, we would go and investigate what happened, and we would try to figure out what happened to the moose, why it died, and what kind of factors contributed to its death. So here you have a picture of some of the DNR employees conducting one of the field necropsies. This was a moose that was in a remote location where we could not get in to extract the entire carcass. So these are a few more cases of where um, field necropsies were done. We also would not extract a carcass if it were a partial carcass like this. We might collect samples and bring them back to the lab, but we wouldn't bring this entire, entire animal down. And you can see this was, this was a live animal, but it was, um, we came back the next day and it had, it had died. So, like I mentioned, the goal was to bring entire carcasses down to the veterinary pathology lab, because having a board-certified pathologist in a lab doing a very detailed necropsy would give us much better results than us kind of hacking away at the wood, out in the woods and trying to figure out what happened. Uh, Liz mentioned winter ticks. These are all engorged ticks. And it's not uncommon for moose to host tens of thousands of ticks on them. There's been reports of hundreds of thousands of ticks on moose during very high tick years. And what happens is that the ticks are consuming so much blood that the moose is having to replenish its almost entire blood supply every few days. So you can imagine that would be very taxing on the animal. And you can see here, these are um, kidneys, and this one on the, this set on the right is from an animal that's really anemic from having to produce so much blood to feed these ticks. And calf moose are much more susceptible to this than adult moose because of their smaller body size. Okay, so some results from the adult project so far. This is from the, the first four years of the study. And you see that this red piece of the pie are confirmed and suspected wolf predation events. And this brown chunk here, this 30% is all parasite-related. And those are mostly parasites that, that moose can get from, um, from deer. Um, additionally, we have this large bacterial infection category, and then undetermined health issues, and then a few other more incidental causes. But kind of the, the main thing I wanted you to take from this is that only about a third of this was wolf-related. A third of, and then the other two-thirds were other causes or health-related. So one of the big findings of the study is that a lot of the moose in northern Minnesota seem to be succumbing to different health-related causes of mortality. And further, these 18 animals that were killed by wolves, many of them had predisposing conditions that made them vulnerable to the wolf attack. So Liz mentioned that brainworm can cause the, the moose to just walk in circles. Well, if they're just walking in circles, that makes them very vulnerable to a wolf. <laughs> um, in addition to causing that kind of behavior, it can also cause bl uh, blindness. So that also makes, makes you kind of a walking target. Okay, so the other big project was the calf mortality project, and that's what I did my PhD on. So I will try to keep this succinct, but I could talk about this for a long, long time. <laughs> um, so, the calf study had several different objectives. First of all, we were trying to estimate survival and cause-specific mortality. So how long the calves were living, and when they died, what they died of. Very similar to the objectives of the adult study. And then we also were examining calving and post-partrition habitat. 
Postpartition means post-birth. So where the mother and calf were spending time during her greatest energy demands because she was lactating and nursing a calf. And then finally we were going to project the population and try to predict what was going to happen with Minnesota's moose based on the survival rates we found in the calf study and then in the adult study. Due to time, I'm only going to be talking about the first and third of these objectives tonight. So why study neonates, or very young, young-aged moose? Well, the variation in their survival can really influence the population growth rates. And in northeastern Minnesota, the causes of calf death were largely unknown. And also, the number of calves surviving to one year was unknown. So that's why this study was, was undertaken. So how do you find a moose calf, and how do you put a GPS collar on it? Because that was our, our main objective, was to try to get a GPS collar on the moose calf so we could track it in the same way that we tracked the adults. So it turns out if you, find, if you follow the moose moms, you can follow, find the moose calves. So adult female moose do a very characteristic and atypical movement pattern right before they give birth. So what I'm showing you here is some GPS data from a cow moose. And you can see here is the beginning of her movement path, and each dot is an hourly location. So you can see here, she was just feeding, bedding down, not moving too far. And then she suddenly took a long distance journey and then localized here. And it's that long distance movement followed by an intense localization that we looked for as an indication of her giving birth. So what we did was we then went into the site and started and looked for, for calves when we saw this characteristic movement. So we put GPS collars on calves. We were the first study to do that in a large scale manner. And through the, fir the first three years of the study, we had three different methods for finding and, and collaring calves. The first year we hired a helicopter crew from Alaska and they came flying in and found the, the mother and calf and handled the calf, took measurements, took a blood sample, handled the calf for about 10 minutes, and then departed. Well, we noticed that a lot of calves were being abandoned by their mothers after this handling procedure. So we then, in response to that, in the next year of the study, we decided to take the helicopter out of the equation and we just decided to do all the captures on the ground, but retaining the entire handling method. So we went in on the ground, found the calves, put on ear tags, took blood, took all the measurements, and we had the same level of abandonment. So midway through that second year, we drastically changed our, our handling methods. And we took our team down to two people that just simply ran in, found the calf, put on the collar, and ran out. And I'll show you what that looked like now. You might get a little motion sick. <laughs> it's short, though. So we're in there looking for the, the calf, the calving location. We see the calf there. Slip the collar on. And then we check to see if it's a, a boy or a girl, and if there's a twin nearby, and then depart. So in doing this, we drastically, we pretty much eliminated capture-related abandonment. But they, they did occur in the first two years, and um, these are some of the calves that were abandoned, and I'm not, I'm not feeding it beer here. There's <laughs> some, actually a formula that we're feeding it. And the, the calves that were abandoned that we were able to retrieve off the landscape are on exhibit here at the zoo now. So there are, I think, six, six moose here now that were, were brought in because of, uh, because of this. However, because of the captured abandonment that occurred, and because of some mortalities that happened in the adult project when they were putting the collars on the adults, Governor Mark Dayton issued an executive order uh, banning the collaring of any moose in the state in, uh, indefinitely. So because of this, we had to get creative in figuring out how we were going to still address our, our um, study objectives. 
So we still had adult females that, that were wearing their GPS collars. And we knew from the first year that they did this calving movement, so we knew where they were calving. And after they gave birth, a lot of times the adult females were moving a lot more slowly than they would without a calf, because they have a little one that is following them around. So we, we could tell when the mother still had a calf at heel or not. And then also in the first years of the study, we noticed that when a calf was killed by something, this is the mother's movement pattern here. She would leave, but then come back to the scene where the calf died, and leave again, and come back, and leave again, sometimes up to nine times in one week. So we're not really sure why. We think just the attachment is, is really strong, the bond is really strong. She's coming back over and over again. So when we saw this pattern, we would go in on the ground and look for signs of, of what, what happened. And you know, Liz mentioned f how finding <coughs> adult bones are hard in the, in the woods. Finding calf bones is, is, is a lot harder, and oftentimes they're just little fragments, especially when the, when the wolves get to them, <coughs> they can break up the bones pretty, pretty handily, and then they scatter them over a, a wide range. So in addition to looking for that movement pattern, we also followed up looking, uh, we would observe the females that we thought gave birth throughout the year um, using a helicopter. Alright, so this is a graph showing the first 30 days of life. Um, and we have survival, the, the per percentage or the proportion of the calves surviving, and on the uh, horizontal axis, how old they are in days. So you can see in the first 30 days of life, about 40% of the calves die. And this was similar using the, the method where we had collars on the calves and our method where we were inferring calf survival from the movement of the mother. When we extend this out to about 250 days, you see that there's also similar patterns, but uh, the survival rate goes to about 40%. So about 60% of the calves die before about nine months of age. This plot is showing the hazard, or the instantaneous probability of death, over, over time. And you can see that the hazard spikes when they're really young, but then tends to decline. And what this plot tells us is that, um, so when the, the mother moose makes her calving movement and then localizes, she tends to stay in that calving location for anywhere from uh, a one to two weeks. She'll stay right in that spot. And it's when they start to leave that secure calving location is when they're, the calves are more vulnerable. So you kind of see that when the, the spike happens is when they're leaving their calving locations and kind of exposing themselves to predation. And now this is getting at the how calves die. You can see that wolf predation accounts for about two-thirds of the natural mortality followed by bear predation. Uh, the other, some other factors of um, lesser importance were natural abandonment, drowning, a case of unknown abandonment, and an unknown predation case. So this is using the GPS collar data from the first two years. When we look at the third year, using the movement pattern to identify mortalities, we see that wolf predation, again, outnumbers bear predation by about a factor of four to one, but we have this very large unknown category because we're not able to get that fine scale tracking data to get in there really quickly to try to understand what happened. These unknown mortalities would happen between helicopter surveys. So we'd see them one time, we wouldn't fly again for a few months, and we wouldn't see a calf with its mother, and we assume that it has died somewhere in that time frame, but we didn't know the cause. So like I mentioned, wolf predation outnumbered bear predation by a factor of about four to one. Uh, wolves have recently been implicated in the decline of moose in Minnesota. As I showed you earlier in the adult study, about one third of the, wolf, of the moose mortalities were due to wolf predation. However, like I mentioned, a lot of those had predisposing conditions making them vulnerable to wolves. Uh, the the, the health-related causes 
that, that are killing moose uh, could also be making them less, less able to defend their calves from predators. So we're thinking that the, the moose herd itself is kind of in poor health, and so they're, they're not able to defend their calves very well. They abandon their calves very readily from, due to our captures, and, um, and they're, they're succumbing to, to wolf predation. And this abandonment that we saw in northeastern Minnesota was a shock to not only us, but to moose researchers around the world. This hadn't been seen before, and a lot of different moose researchers from around the world, including Rolf Peterson and John Busetich, who Liz worked with, um, help, tried to help us make sense of this. So now I'm going to talk about how we tried to project the population through time using the survival rates that we saw in the calves and in the adults. So first of all, this is the, the observed population that I showed you earlier from northeastern Minnesota. And you can see that decline that happened kind of in the, um, around 2010. Now there was a paper that came out in 2010 that, was, that estimated the trajectory of the population. And it estimated that this was going to happen. That the population would continue to decline and then eventually crash. And you can see that they were right on for a few years of data. But recently, during the recent stabilization, we've been outperforming their, their kind of doom and gloom scenario. When I look at the average growth rate from this entire time series here, so looking at the change in population and averaging that for the whole time series we have, it's still a decline of about 4% per year. And the population still goes down. And this is projected out 50 years. So that's based on the observed from the, the longer term data. When I look at the more short-term stabilization, so if I look at the growth rates that are just happening during the stable period, we see the population is kind of on an upward trajectory. And it's about a 2% growth rate per year. But a 2% growth rate per year compounded goes up quite, quite quickly. And then the final projection is using the rates that we observed in the study, from the adult survival rates and the calf survival rates. And if those rates were to hold steady, the population theoretically should be going gangbusters. But, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> These are pr predictions, and, um, and a lot of things can change. So in these projections, one of the biggest changes was looking at the short-term versus long-term data. When we used the longer-term data, we still saw a, an overall decrease in the population. Using that shorter term stabilization, this, the, the situation looks a little bit better. So there's this you know, stability and growth versus decline of the, of the two. And any long term study will capture variability in environmental conditions and, and other random events that can happen. As Liz pointed out, there was that severe winter in 96, there was canine, canine parvovirus that came into the Isle Royale system. This is, you know, on a slightly larger scale, but environmental variation can influence things and different uh, events that we can't predict. And so these longer term studies can try to capture some of that variability and then see how the population responds to it. And as I said, there's a lot of uncertainty in these, in these projections, so we'll kind of see what happens. So this is kind of a schematic showing all the different things that are affecting moose in Minnesota. And today, or my research only looked at how habitat and predators are influencing moose, and specifically only moose calves. So my research was you know, fairly, fairly narrow. There's a lot of other things going on here. And this is just kind of, <laughs> kind of a, a spaghetti map of, of what um, all the different things that can be going on. So climate change is overarching, affecting everything, affecting habitat, affecting ticks, and this tick is to represent all diseases that the moose have. Um, there's deer that it can be affected by, by um, the predators. The deer can affect the, the parasites. Um, the deer can increase the wolf numbers, so then uh, there are more, more wolves around, so then they can incidentally uh, prey on moose. So it's a, it's a complicated picture. So when people ask, you know, is, is the moose problem solved? You know, I say no, but the, <laughs> the media says yes, that it is solved. 
and that uh, deer have a direct role in the death of Minnesota moose, which I don't disagree with. But, um, you know, deer, we saw deer parasites contribute to a lot of moose mortality. So that might be one of the answers. But as you can see, the, the subheadline says, uh, hunters resist thinning the deer herd. So people like moose and people like deer, and having the two coexist might not be possible. At the, this point, we're not sure what density of deer is required to have moose uh, prosper. On Isle Royale, we see zero deer. It works great. <laughs> but I don't think that that uh, having zero deer on the landscape in northeastern Minnesota is going to work. So we'll see. Um, another item from the news recently is that the, the Minnesota wolf population has increased 25% in the past year. That, that number is very staggering to me, that a population can increase 25% in one year. Um, but if it does, there's obviously going to be implications to the, the moose population as well. So we'll, we'll see if any of those skyrocketing population projections happen. So in conclusion, are moose here to stay? You know, it's, it's unclear. We'll have to, you know, wait and see. With the DNR is doing continued monitoring every year. Um, the, the coloring projects have, have ended, but they still measure the population every year. Um, there's some habitat restoration projects that are going on, and hopefully that can improve nutrition, and then uh, maybe increase calf survival. Um, the long-term data that's being collected is really invaluable to find out what's happening with the moose population. And in the end, you know, there's a lot of change happening on the landscape. There are some projections that say you know, the boundary waters are going to turn into oak savanna. If that happens, you know, moose aren't an oak savanna species, so they're not going to stick around. And all this research is kind of meant to inform management and to try to hope, hopefully make ecologically sound management decisions to try to benefit and maintain the resource. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And we'll continue with that. So does anyone have questions for either of us? Yes? Um, Minnesota versus Maine versus Ontario versus Alaska. What's going on in those other regions where it's moose? If you've got an answer, go for it. Okay, so the question was, what's happening with moose in other parts of North America? Um, Minnesota moose are at the kind of the southern geographic extent of their, of their North American range, and we're seeing declines. There's places in Ontario that are seeing population declines as well. It's a little spottier. Ontario is very big and has a ton of moose, and so there's, um, there's a lot of differences site by site. Um, in New England, the moose are doing, doing well in some areas. They're starting to expand more southward, uh, they've expanded into Massachusetts and Connecticut, and um, but what's happening there is that they, they seem to be kind of expanding their range, but their densities are pretty low, and they're really getting hit hard by the winter ticks. So they're, they'll have, you know, we had calves that survived, you know, only about 30% of our calves survived in one year but all of the mortality happened in that first summer, you know, where, where predators got them in that first summer. They have the exact opposite situation, where calves are living fine throughout their summer and then they die at the end of their first winter because the winter ticks are hitting them so hard. And they don't have wolves there, they don't have, um, you know, they have coyotes, but I don't think they're able to take down uh, or get the calves away from the mother. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, there, there are regional differences, but it, it seems like a lot more declines are starting to pop up. You know, in Montana, they're having regional declines as well. Colorado, for some reason, seems to be great. Um, the moose are doing fine there. They've been introduced to some kind of high alpine meadows, and they're doing fine there. I mean, there's no wolves, and it's cool. So it's kind of moose heaven. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's kind of spotty. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Both those states where you have moose increases don't have wolf, pop uh, wolf populations. 
and Montana, uh, you know, Yellowstone, for instance, there's no wolves hunted there. Uh, Minnesota, a very limited amount of wolves are taken here. What a, and our population is exploding. And uh, I have family and I have friends in the north who you know, live in that environment. And uh, they see that. And when that is the situation, you know, uh, hunting can bring down the population of deer and keep it in a, in a uh, livable check with a healthy herd. Uh, we don't want to do that with moose because there isn't a healthy herd. But you don't have a herd in most of the state, the northern part of the state anymore. Back in the 90s, uh, up where I uh, used to hunt for deer, uh, New Folden, uh, Deep River Falls area, we saw moose every time we went out. And I mean, we saw you know, a herd of moose. And they all died because of the ticks. And, uh, and that was tragic because they're beautiful animals. And, uh, and, you know, and to see that happening and, and now add the predator issue in there, you know, can't we reduce the predator to a reasonable rate to help, you know, uh, the insect <coughs> issue and, uh, you know, the parasite issue, you know, wouldn't that bring the population up? Um, I can start and then if you want to jump in. So, um, like in Yellowstone where the wolves... Oh yes, thank you for reminding me to do that. So um, I, the question, and correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, would reducing the predator population, in this case the expanding wolf population, via controlled managed hunting be beneficial for the overall moose population? That's correct. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so in the, like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, when they uh, brought wolves back, um, they actually saw increased numbers in the different, all of the different species in that area and rebounding healthier populations, which seems kind of counterintuitive that a healthy predator population means a healthy prey population, um, but that is how it, it seems to work out in the ecosystem because as Bill mentioned, um, the wolves are, a wolf cannot kill a healthy adult moose. Um, it can only kill calves or very sick moose. So um, inevitably, with pretty much any wild population, infants are always going to be at high risk. And when you get into trouble is when those adults are at too high of risk. Um, but since the wolves are only taking the sick moose, having a high number of wolves is actually really great uh, for that whole survival of the fittest idea where they're taking diseased animals out of the population. Uh, so we need a, a healthy, you know, strong number, a high number of wolves in Minnesota, um, and they are, if they're killing calves or adults that are sick with brainworm or um, ticks or weakened by arthritis and things like that. Do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, uh, I, I guess I, what I would add is right now we're not able to control the wolves at all here. They're, they're, they're listed on the endangered species list now. Um, we might see increases in calf survival, but like we see in New England, it might just increase their survival for the summer, and it might die of these other health causes later on in the year. So it could be um, kind of other forms of mortality might be kicking in, and, and that, I don't know if we'll see a lot of more higher adult survival if we take out the, the wolves because there are these health issues. We did. So in the wild, uh, moose live about eight to ten years. Would you go with that number? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's pretty similar for wolves, actually. Um, so at the zoo, they, they would live at the longer end of that spectrum, maybe even a little longer than that, because they don't have to deal with the, the same health issues. They don't have to deal with parasites. They don't have those, any of those mortality causes that they would have in the wild. Wolf moose studies are not a royal because it's sort of a classic study. I was unaware of, of the other research that's 
going on that you alluded to, or did I misunderstand you? I'm wondering about that list of mammals. You indicated that there was other research going on. And specifically with regard to that, I wonder about those snowshoe hares. Are there links on our royal? What's controlling the snowshoe hare population? Yeah, great question. So the wolf moose research team uh, does research. Thank you. Sorry. I keep forgetting to repeat the question. Um, so the, um, you asked if there's research going on with the other mammals found on Isle Royale. And um, there is research going on with all of those mammal species, but kind of tangentially to the wolf moose done by the same researchers. So they do study <coughs> snowshoe hare on the island. There are no links on the island. So the snowshoe hares are preyed on by um, the wolves and by red foxes. There are red fox on the island. And the snowshoe hares go up and down. There's quite a lot of them this year. So there's a boom bust in the snowshoe hares, just as there are where there's lynx. It's a similar model. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Exactly. And I just saw that they're they're talking about potentially reintroducing lynx. Yeah. The royal yep. Well. So that's another another ongoing debate. Yeah. Yeah. Let's appeal for some. Are the wolves immune to the brain disease that the moose are getting from the deer? Yes, I don't believe brainworm affects wolves at all. Correct. Yeah. Good question, yeah. Did they worry about the Isle Royale, or was it a different isle? At one point they trapped all the moose off, or all the wolves off, and we had the population crash between either the deer herd or the moose here because of no, no predation. Basically, they ate themselves out of home. Um, I don't believe they've ever trapped all wolves on Isle Royale. Um, they did, um, before it was wilderness and national park, they did like control, they did bring some deer over to hunt when they had like hunting lodges and people would come over for fancy vacations and hunt deer. Um, and they did do some trapping of coyotes and wolves in the vicinity where people were living on the island at that time. Um, I don't know if they've ever completely, I don't think they've ever completely eliminated predators, but there were no wolves there before the 1940s, naturally. Um, and at that time, we would have seen the, the boom and bust of the moose population. Yeah. I don't think I repeated the question again. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was about Sweden's moose population, and Sweden has so many moose. The the harvest they they harvest more moose in Sweden than we have like in all of North America, or, so, or maybe the lower forty eight, I should say. It's a huge huge population. They Sweden they have really really dense populations of moose. They have very low wolf numbers. They also have some forestry practices that make really good moose habitat. Um, so those I think are the factors that, that I've heard about that, that contribute to the really dense population. Towards the southern part of Sweden they are starting to see some declines and some health issues. So it, it, whether that has to do with the, being the warmer part or, or what, but um, they, they do have kind of again that more spotty uh, response going on. The question is, do they have deer in Sweden? They do have, they do have, they have deer, but they don't have our white-tailed deer. And as far as I know, they don't have the same parasites. Yeah. Um, in regards to the bears, are the bears killing the most for food, or is it more of a territorial thing? Um, bears. I mean, on Isle Royale there aren't bears, so they, there's no bears there. But I, I, they might eat moose calves. I don't believe black bears would ever kill an adult moose. Yeah, I, I don't know of any records of black bears killing adults, but yeah, we definitely saw them eating and consuming calves. And one of the things that we looked for to try to tell if it was bear predation or wolf predation was that bears would, you know, there's only one bear and there's a whole pack of wolves. So it would take one bear a while to eat a whole carcass. So they would hide different pieces of it. So oftentimes they would hide the head, they'd bury the head, and then we'd have to go and find that. Um, luckily 
Probably the collar was still attached to it, so that's how we can find it. <laughs> there was one time when we had, you know, we, we try to find the collars with, with, it's like a radio collar, so we have an antenna, and we're walking through the woods looking for it, and we couldn't find this collar. We could hear it, and we couldn't find it anywhere, and we walked back and forth and back and forth, and I started looking up in the trees to see where it was, and I looked down, and it was, it was buried in a hole, and a, a bear had done that, so I would come back for it later. be a long answer. <laughs> um, so the question was about the executive order that, that banned collaring of moose in the state. Um, I think that it was a very uh, not scientifically based decision. Um, I think it was more, <laughs> with my you know, diplomatic hat on, <laughs> I, I think that it was a more of an emotionally driven decision. Um, we talked to the policy advisor of the governor, and 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 we had other people talking on our behalf to the gov to that policy advisor, and said, you know, that we had letters of support written by moose biologists across, around the world, and what we were getting back from the governor's office was just no. This was a very emotional issue for him, and he felt very strongly that we were doing more harm than good. And he had seen some of the press conferences that he gave and some of the things he said. I, I don't think he has all the information. Um, I would love to sit down and talk with him sometime about it. <laughs> um, but we, it, it, the order would have to be rescinded by, by him or a future governor. And so we're, you know, the, the state can't permit, permit the coloring of moose. However, the tribes can do what they want. So, uh, Grand Portage is, can, has continued to color moose and moose calves, or moose adults and calves, ever since, and they're they're doing fine. Yes. <clears throat> So the question was, um, caribou moved out of the state due to for land use changes and climate change issues and, and um, wondering if moose would kind of follow that same path. Um, I mean, they, they moved northward, so it's predicted that you know, moose range would contract northward as well. So I would, I would think so. One more question over here. Yeah. Are there a couple of things about the winter ticks? Are they indigenous, and how long is, do we have documentation of them being affecting the most population? Yeah, they um, they are native to this area, but I am not, I'm not sure how long we have records of them being here. Well, the Fine. the winter tick evolved with white-tailed deer, so white-tailed deer are very good at grooming them off. Um, there, when uh, moose and elk kind of came over from Eurasia and interacted with deer and interacted with this winter tick, they, they don't know really how to deal with it. And they, they groom, but they groom after the tick is already kind of established on the body. And that's where they you know, break off their hair and they rub themselves raw trying to get it off. So deer, who evolved with the winter tick, very good at dealing with the tick. Same thing with the parasites. The, um, brain worm and liver flukes. And moose are kind of a, a relative newcomer to the scene. So that's why they're not really able to deal with these these novel things. Yeah, and the, the range is overlapping more as deer move northward and highways make it easier for deer to migrate north and there's a lot of things causing that new overlap. Yeah. Straight question, but just like you give a dog tick medicine, since there's so few news. Is there a tick medicine that you give a moose? 
<laughs> the question is, can we medicate the moose to, to, to uh, avoid getting ticks? And, you know, I think for, for dogs, you can give them a shot of iver, ivermectin or put a flea collar on, but it doesn't last yes. more than a season. Every, yeah, every season. So capturing every moose <laughs> multiple so times. 4,000, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a white collar. It's a thing. Right, yeah. <laughs> so I like you thinking outside the box. Put it on their collar. Yeah, yeah. right, when they're ready a collar. Yeah. Great. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs>